From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today during this week's cattle market segment, we'll hear from Iowa State University's Lee Schultz. He'll talk about the staying power of cattle prices right now. And as part of that, comments on retail beef featuring for the holidays, which appears to be shaping up quite well, says Lee. Then K-State's Justin Wagner will talk about the role of alfalfa as a featured forage in cow-calf and backgrounding rations. That's a topic he'll be addressing at the Winter Forage Conference, co-sponsored by K-State early next month in Wichita. And later, Jeff Wickman with this week's 4-H segment. He'll talk with K-State's Aliyah Mestrovich C. about the success of the 4-H Youth Citizen Open Forum along with much more right here on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Welcome once more. And as we do on a Monday, we open up with a glance to the cattle markets. And this time, we tap into the insight from Lee Schultz. Lee, as you know, is a livestock economist out of Iowa State University. Lee, we're coming off of another week where the cattle market cooled off some, perhaps, from recent weeks, but still trending upward, it seems. Yeah, I think we, we've, you know, I, I wouldn't say we've stalled the markets. I think this week we did trade a, a bit sideways, but I think there's several fundamentals that are still pointing upwards. Uh, box beef prices continue to, to show some strength um, in the market. I think, you know, basis levels still remain, you know, relatively strong for, for this time of year. Um, so we've, we've seen, you know, pretty aggressive bids by packers. Slaughter levels, you know, I think we, we did maybe take a little bit of a step back this week, um, a little bit lower than, than year ago levels and, and lower than, than last week. Uh, but we continue to, to really move the, the large supplies of cattle that we have. Uh, if we look at historically, you know, the last couple of years, we, we really did see prices continue to carry um, into the new year. And I think you know, several factors are, are suggesting we could continue to see that this year. And what are those factors that have led to this enthusiasm, if you will? Well, I think, namely, it's relatively strong demand situation uh, here, both domestically and, and on the export market. As far as the supply situation, I think we're rather current in our marketings. You know, we'll get some more evidence of that with the cattle on feed report to come. But but I think when you look at cattle weights, uh, they're lower than, than last week. They're lower than, than year ago levels, which, which suggests um, we're rather current um, in those marketings. And so even though supplies are rather large. I think the demand's there, and, and really we, we have the chain speed to continue to move the cattle through the system. Expanding on the demand side, and you recently on the domestic front put up an article on the featuring of beef for the holidays, noting that uh, that has been ramping up. And actually, to be particular about it, the market for beef roasts starts to accelerate at this time of the year, which is helpful to the market, you say. Yeah, I think, you know, when we look at currently as, as we get into the fall and, and, and winter, um, you know, we're, we're looking at much more the, the middle meats um, and, and roasts in particular. Um, you know, I think when you're looking at the holiday season, consumers certainly have a lot of choices, as we've seen record uh, red meat and, and poultry supplies. But I, I think retailers are really out there featuring the products and, and certainly going to be, you know, some good deals for consumers. And beef's at a price point where I think it's buying. For, for many consumers, and I think that's you know going to really kind of help continue the demand story of strong demand here domestically and should certainly help prices as we're dealing with these larger supplies. So have the middle meats then actually climbed significantly in price in recent weeks? Is that the case? 
Well, I think it, it's a yes and no. As you look at, at wholesale values, um, certainly we've really seen some escalation here from early September um, through October. Um, that's kind of the, the ramp up to wholesalers getting the purchases ready for the holiday season. Um, and so, yes, I think that really shows the demand situation. Also, I think given you know we've seen strong exports here um, in the third and, and in the fourth quarter, I think that's suggestive of those higher wholesale wholesale values. But also, I, I you know, would contend that we do see retailers really do a lot of featuring. And so that is some discounts or even buy one, get one free. So yes, prices are stronger here um, as we're getting into the holiday season. But given the large supplies of beef and pork and poultry, you know, I think consumers are going to be on, on the lookout for kind of getting the, that consumer dollar. And, and so retailers will be very strong in their featuring. Well, what is the latest, if you would, Lee, on the beef export front? Apparently, we are selling some beef to China, a uh, recent 1,400 metric tons moving to that country and potentially more sales to come. China, obviously not the only customer in the mix there. What is the story? When you look at year over year, um, we, we are down in accumulated exports so far. I, you know, I think that's not so much of a knock on this year, but just how great last year was. And even the year before that, when we've seen double digit year over year increases. So yes, from a, from a year over year standpoint, we've kind of taken a step back here in 2019, but I, I don't think we could have really continued the momentum we've seen the last couple of years. But I think where the optimism is, we've made a lot of sales, not only for this year in 2019 that are on the books, the product hasn't been delivered yet, but even starting to get into 2020. You noted here the the sale to China. Um, Remember, China is still a very small market for us. You know, roughly 1% of our exports uh, go to China. But also the sales that have been made recently are to Japan and to South Korea, as well as Mexico, some rather large sales that that are currently on the book. So I think that's where really the optimism is for growth for exports is, you know, we're seeing continued purchases, not only for for this year, but even starting into next year. Lee, you tell us you've been kicking around some numbers lately on the potential profit margins for backgrounding beef calves. How do those look? Certainly, really some optimism, both compared to last year, what we were kind of projecting for for backgrounding margins, but even especially as we looked at just a couple of months ago and the opportunity for higher calf prices and now what we're realizing now. Um, A lot of the numbers that I'm showing is, you know, marketing calves now or comparing that to, you know, add 50, 100, 200, 300 pounds to those calves really are showing a large value proposition, especially, I think, really kind of in the short term here. Um, And that's really supported by when you kind of look at that price weight slide of calves that really there's higher prices for seven, eight, nine weight calves than maybe even six weight calves. And why that's the case is, you know, I think we are a little bit tighter supply on those yearling calves, and they really align with some of the highest prices of closeouts for feedlots as we get into 2020. So feedlots have really been bidding up those yearling prices um, and incentivizing producers to add weight to those calves before marketing them. And as long as feed grain prices remain somewhat static, the potential for returns to backgrounding would stick around for a while in a favorable way. And that's really what we've seen. I mean, actually, corn prices have come down, even though we, we've seen some challenges with harvest here. You know, just as of Monday, I, I think we were about 60% done with corn harvest here in Iowa. Uh, that's about 20% behind last year, uh, where we were at this time period. So even with, you know, a lot of corn still sitting in the field, you know, prices have relatively moderated. You know, I think basis levels are, are still pretty strong, but that, that feed cost situation is still pretty moderate and is really incentivizing adding weight to those calves, either still on grass potentially in some areas or as we see some of them adding it through corn. All right. Well, you mentioned it earlier, the USDA this coming Friday will post its monthly cattle on feed report. What are traders and other market observers thinking those numbers will say to us? This is a big report, uh, especially when we look at placements. Traditionally, 
October placements are the, the largest of, of the year. Last year w- was kind of an anomaly in the sense that we didn't really see the surge in placements um, relative to September, especially. Usually September starts to ramp them up and then really large placements in October. So I think when, when you look at this cattle on feed report here coming out, it, it's going to suggest some rather large placements, but I think we got to take that in the context that October maybe was a little bit lower than usual last year. So I don't think it should be a major shock to the market. You know, if anything, it's going to impact uh, prices a little bit longer term into 2020. I think we're expecting cattle on feed numbers really at par uh, with year ago levels. And I, I'm really continuing to watch that, that marketed number, which I expect to be pretty close to year ago levels. I would like to see it a little bit higher than year ago levels because that would really indicate that these markets are rather current um, and we won't see that buildup of supplies here later in the year. And that'll certainly be supportive of prices. Yeah, I think we got to remember in, in October here, we had several weather events, some snowstorms, some seasonally kind of wet weather, and I think that certainly impacted placement, so, so that could add some variability to that. And so I wouldn't be too surprised really with that placement number. I think expectations are it could be a pretty wide number, and I think we could really rationalize it just given the situation that played out here in October. See what those new numbers say to us out of the USDA come Friday and the cattle on feed report. So lastly, again, the cattle markets in general have had a nice run of it. They paused for a bit this past trading week. As you look ahead, any reason to think that prices might retreat or are we looking at stable to maybe improve prices ahead? I'm I'm in the latter camp there. You know, I, I think when you look at currently the the February contract uh, compared to the December contract, I mean, you, you're dealing with a spread of about six dollars per hundredweight. I think that's really supporting December prices. You're really seeing strong basis bids in, in 2020 by packers, and I think that's really going to help hold up prices. Um, and just given what we've seen historically the last couple of years, and I think conditions are, are very similar, that that likely will add some support here as, as we go throughout November and into December. Very good. And your input, always appreciated, Lee. Thanks for the comments. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Livestock economist Lee Schultz, Iowa State University, with our cattle market segment. And we'll be back shortly on this Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today continues now, and on this segment, we'll draw from a topic that will be covered at the upcoming Kansas Forage and Grassland Council Winter Forage Conference, which is going to be co-sponsored by Kansas State University in the early part of December in Wichita. And that topic is the forage we know so well in Kansas, alfalfa, and its role and purpose in beef cattle production. Addressing that at this annual meeting will be our guest now, Justin Wagner, Beef Systems Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Justin is based in southwest Kansas, as you know. So alfalfa is known widely as the queen of the forages, Justin, and there's no question it plays a dynamic role in beef cattle feeding. You know, that's that's correct, Eric. If you look at, you know, a variety of segments or aspects of the, the cattle industry, all the way from the cow-calf sector uh, through the growing backgrounding segment, all the way to the feedlot. So there's really a place for alfalfa in, in all of those different segments of the industry. We think of it so many times as a staple of the finishing ration. That's most assuredly true at our feedlot settings, isn't it? Yeah, from a feedlot perspective, uh, we often think of yards that, that maybe don't utilize corn silage or maybe don't use as much corn silage as others, but they're going to rely pretty heavily on alfalfa as a forage in those rations. Um, you know, typically with alfalfa, the quality, it's, it's relatively consistent. There's a lot of reasons that uh, that we like alfalfa in that system. It's As a forage, it, it tends to be 
pretty nutrient dense, both in terms of its if its energy is as well as its protein content. So, it, you know, in, in that segment, it certainly brings some characteristics where we're not uh, diluting out any of the energy of that that ration with that forage, or at least we're limiting that uh, relative to utilizing a lower quality forage in, in place of that alfalfa. Mm-hmm. So, it fits very well to some extent. But we can talk about alfalfa at the other stages of cattle production. Let's go with the backgrounding program, if we might. Clearly, if one's growing calves, alfalfa's protein and energy resources can be beneficial. Yeah, as we look at calves in, in that segment, typically, you know, as an animal is younger, their their nutrient requirements are a little bit higher in terms of the protein content. And, and that's, you know, as we look at those rations, they tend to be rations that are going to rely more heavily on forages as opposed to concentrates. There is some concentrate use in that. You know, we're really looking at, at trying to utilize forages in that segment to grow those cattle. Alfalfa certainly, you know, has a place in those rations as well. You know, a lot of times we see, you know, in the in the growing backgrounding segment, we may we often see producers that will use two to three different forages, but alfalfa is going to be the one that is kind of a mainstay in there. We may may swap that out with some brine with some grass hay or or maybe even some silage that comes into that ration, but, but you'll oftentimes alfalfa would be, you know, one of the common ingredients that we would see in a lot of those type of rations that, that would utilize that. And, you know, as you stated, from its protein composition, it certainly uh, has a place there as well. In your view, what other forages does alfalfa best complement in a growing ration? Or are there multiple answers to that? Well, I, I think that there are multiple answers to that. You know, I, I can think of a lot of different scenarios. You know, one of the more common ones, you know, is if we think of, of just simply native grass hay. That hay is typically going to be, you know, let's say 5 to 7% crude protein. So if you're looking at taking that forage as a way to, to utilize that in those operations, combining that with alfalfa, there's a really nice complement of we've still got the forage but the alfalfa with its nutrient profile is going to going to match nicely with a lot of those forages that might be a little bit lower on that protein spectrum to get to that calf's nutrient requirements. Mm-hmm. Well, we're staying with the growing ration for a moment here, Justin. Does alfalfa perform better as part of a total mixed ration with the grain concentrate and perhaps the other lower quality forages as well? You know, that's that's where I tend to, to think of it having, you know, where we're putting that in a ration, blending that to, together with some other feedstuffs. You know, there, there's probably some places where, where it could be utilized. You know, I, I, it starts to move into, well, if we have those, maybe those cattle turned out on some sort of a forage base, maybe we've turned them back out on native grass and, and we need to use something as a protein supplement. Alfalfa could certainly have a place there, but, you know, typically in the grower background or operations, I that's the two ways in which I think it's most commonly used is would be putting in a TMR or maybe using it as what I'd call kind of that supplement role where we're utilizing it to, to maybe bring a little bit of extra protein into those cattle that might be on some sort of a low input grazing program. Well, let's take it back down another notch on the production chain to the cow-calf operation. We're always attempting to economize as best we can in that cow herd feeding. Nonetheless, alfalfa can uh, hold a spot in that ration as well, can it not? Oh, sure, Eric. You know, I I like to think back, you know, if we look at the cow-calf segment in the state of Kansas and, and we looked at common sources of, of supplemental feed resources over the years. You know, alfalfa has really been a, a common supplement that we've fed in the cow-calf sector for a number of years. You know, if we go back several years before a lot of the byproducts were as readily available as they are today, you know, our primary types of supplement that we would use on a cow-calf operation, one of those would be alfalfa hay or maybe some sort of a range cube. Those would have been the one of the more common feedstuffs that we would have utilized in those types of operations. So, you know, it certainly has a place in that cow-calf segment and has had for for many years. Uh, And, you know, oftentimes it was utilized simply because it was an an on-farm resource that was grown on-farm. It could be gone out and purchased, but it was, you know, really not uncommon for a producer to have a set of cows to have a little bit of alfalfa that they would produce and then utilize that as their supplemental feed 
or part of their supplemental feed program throughout the winter months. So many cow-calf producers, as you're suggesting there, rely on byproducts as their main feedstuff. There are one of those. And are there any particular byproducts that, again, alfalfa would complement more readily? Well, I, I'm not sure that it's an issue of, of complementing, you know, one or the other. I think, you know, alfalfa certainly at times, depending on market conditions, is is a feedstuff that can certainly be um, cost effective on a cost per unit of protein basis. So it's it's really not necessarily, in my opinion, one of complementarity, but maybe one of, you know, if price conditions are right, I can certainly use the legalized alfalfa uh, maybe in place of, of a byproduct, if possible, it just depends on where the economics are, are at, given current market conditions. And that leads to another question. Once one starts the cow herd on a routine of feeding alfalfa, does that routine need to stay constant? In other words, uh, feeding every day uh, or so, or can one get away with a periodic feeding? What's your thought on that? Well, uh, you know, as we look at maybe feeding hay and, and the reasons that we might be feeding hay that maybe plays a role in that. If we're looking at feeding hay as a means of substituting a portion of whatever that cow's intake would be, we're probably in a scenario where we would, we're would we going to get the best response if we were to feed alfalfa on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, there are some scenarios where we you could certainly – maybe stretch that out to an every other day protocol, but it certainly and wouldn't fall into that category where we could maybe go to that extreme that we would talk about of infrequent supplementation of maybe once per week that we might want to consider uh, with a, a higher protein type uh, supplement that we would feed. So, you know, there's a little bit of, there's quite a bit of a difference between a program that's utilizing alfalfa and a program that might be utilizing a higher percent protein type feed stuff like a you know, a 30 or a 31 to a 38% crude protein type supplement. So for the most part, alfalfa is going to be a feed stuff that we would want to to feed probably on a daily basis to look at getting the, the best response there. So again, if you're looking to economize on your feeding program, don't scrimp on alfalfa because it is cost effective. You know, it certainly can be just like with everything else. It is competitive at certain times in the market. There are times where you know, it's we always have to be cognizant of current market conditions and kind of looking at what our cost per unit of nutrient are, whether that's protein or energy or or both in some cases. Which and that's that's one of the nice things about alfalfa is we do get to some degree both of those things coming into play. Well, there are a collection of thoughts on utilizing alfalfa in cattle feeding at whatever point in production that you are as a cow-calf producer, backgrounder, finisher. And, Justin, you'll be sharing more data on alfalfa utilization at that Forage and Grassland Council meeting coming up soon. That's correct, Eric. That is on Tuesday, December the 10th, by the way, Sedgwick County Research and Extension Center there in West Wichita. You can go to the Kansas Forage and Grassland Council website for more on participating in that winter forage conference. That web address, by the way, ksfgc.org, ksfgc.org. And we appreciate the overview right here, Justin. Many thanks to you. Thanks, Eric. Justin Wagner with us. He is a beef systems specialist with K-State Research and Extension. And now we need to break away for a few moments. When we return, today's agricultural news headlines coming your way. Also, this week's edition of Tree Tales with K-State Forester Charlie Barden doing the honors this week. And once more, Jeff Wickman awaits with this week's Kansas 4-H segment. So keep it right here, won't you? This is Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test fix save a life this message brought to you by the kansas radon program the kansas association of broadcasters and this station
Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Next up for you, today's agricultural news headlines, these courtesy in part of DTM. Tyson Fresh Meats announced this morning that reconstruction of its processing plant at Holcomb that was damaged in that fire on August the 9th is now near completion. Officials said efforts to resume harvest operations will begin the first week of December with intentions to be fully operational by the first week of January. That fire severely damaged a critical part of the plant containing the hydraulic and electrical systems that support the harvest floor and the cooler areas. Reconstruction included completely replacing support beams and the roof, hydraulic piping and pumps, installing more than 50,000 feet of new wiring, and the reconstruction of all new electrical panel rooms and equipment. Now, since the fire, cattle have been diverted to the company's other beef facilities in an effort to offset some of the production volume losses and help mitigate the disruption. The Holcomb facility is expected to begin receiving cattle the first week of December. A majority of farms remain profitable. However, their profit margins are smaller than in recent years, and bankers are growing more concerned about their customers' liquidity. That's all according to a survey by the American Bankers Association and the Federal Agricultural Mortgage Corporation, more commonly known as Farmer Mac. The survey says that agricultural lenders reported more than 57% of their borrowers made a profit this year. They expect 56% to remain profitable through 2020. However, 82.5% of all respondents noted that those profits were declining, liquidity and working capital topping the survey as the lender's top concern. Farmer Mac Chief Economist Jackson Takish told DTN in the past it was usually income or commodity prices, something more related to the annual cash flow that were the issues. He says, quoting here, I think that's a change in the tune of the lenders to make sure farmers have enough working capital on the farm to take advantage of opportunities, or if there is continued pressure, that they have the strength in the balance sheet to survive. Bankers, he said, will be watching the farmland market closely this year. His survey found that most bankers expect a modest decline in farmland values of 10 percent or less. The Trump administration announced a second tranche of 2019 market facilitation program payments on Friday. According to a USDA news release, payments will begin the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, the MFP for 2019 providing $14.5 billion in direct payments to producers, meaning that the second tranche will be for about $7.8 billion. Under MFP2, the USDA so far has paid out $6.69 billion to over 560,000 producers. The USDA reporting the top five states for payments are Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, and Minnesota. The 18 MFP paid out $8.6 billion to more than $1 million. In farmers. Producers of MFP eligible commodities will now be eligible to receive 25% of the total payment expected, in addition to the 50% they already received from the 2019 MFP. MFP sign up at Farm Service Agency offices will run through December the 6th. Meantime, USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue had this to say about the first phase trade deal between the U.S. and China and how it could benefit producers in relation to the currently planned market facilitation program payments. If we get a major trade deal, when I'm talking about a major trade deal, the purchase quantities are double what they've ever bought before. Now, the proof's in the pudding. We want to see the contracts. We want to see the orders, not just the commitment. But if we have China buying twice as much as they've ever bought before, that ought to move the markets. Farmers, while they have benefited and needed the market facilitation program, they really would rather have trade than aid. And to some degree, the dichotomy of the emotions out there are farmers would rather have the money from the scales and the mailbox. And that's why it's been sort of unfulfilling to some degree. We don't want to have to rely on them permanently. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue. Meantime, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross was interviewed over the weekend on Fox Business News saying he feels there are high odds of a Phase 1 trade deal between the U.S. and China. He also observed that the Phase 1 deal is relatively limited in scope, and the debate now is on the level of that limitation. 
Next up on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of Tree Tales with K-State Forester, Charlie Barden. Charlie? I think the appearance and aroma of a real Christmas tree helps make the holiday season complete. Did you know that Christmas tree growers are located throughout Kansas? For a fun family activity, visit your local Christmas tree farm this holiday season and choose and cut your very own special tree. Many farms also offer hay rack rides and are open every weekend from Thanksgiving to Christmas. Just enter Kansas Christmas Tree Farms in your web search engine to bring up several informative sites. Many counties also have a local tree farm. A well-cared-for Christmas tree is certainly not a fire hazard. You know the tree is fresh if you cut it yourself from a local grower, but what if you choose a pre-cut tree on a lot? Be sure to choose one that has flexible dark green needles. Shake a limb, and if only a few yellow needles fall out, that is okay. But if lots of green needles drop, that tree may already become too desiccated during shipping. Next, lift the tree. It should seem heavy for its size if it has a high moisture content. When you get home, no matter where you bought your tree, cut off another inch or two from the stump end and place it immediately in water. This helps reopen any pitch-clogged pores. A new tree can easily absorb a gallon of water in the first 24 hours, so make sure it does not run dry. After that, usually a tree drinks just one or two quarts a day. Be sure to check the water level in the stand frequently. Placing the tree away from radiators or heat ducts can also reduce the tendency to dry out. Some people recommend placing a penny or an aspirin in the water to reduce mold growth, but this does not really seem to benefit the tree or prevent it from drying out. I hope this year you will consider a real tree and perhaps even visit one of our Kansas Christmas tree farms. You've been listening to Tree Tales. I'm Charles Barden, Forest of the K-State Research and Extension. Many thanks, Charlie, as the holidays are encroaching very rapidly now. Do want to take a couple of moments here to fill in some of the details on that Kansas Forage and Grassland Council Winter Forage Conference. Again, it's taking place Tuesday, December the 10th at the Sedgwick County Research and Extension Center in West Wichita. We mentioned that Justin Wagner of K-State will be talking about alfalfa utilization. Also on the program, K-State's Jamie Lynn Farney. She'll be talking about cover crops, uh, Walt Fick, We'll be talking about controlling old world blue stem, and there'll be much more on this program. So if you have a chance, get it on your calendar. And if you'd like to know more, go to ksfgc.org to find out about registering for the Winter Forage Conference put on by the Kansas Forage and Grassland Council and K-State on Tuesday, December the 10th in Wichita. This is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. Kansas 4-H and the K-State Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy held a Community Conversations 4-H Youth Citizen Open Forum last month to give youth an opportunity to use the leadership and communication skills they've learned through 4-H to learn how to have difficult conversations. Kansas 4-H Culture and Communication Skills Specialist Alaya Mestrovich C. says the reaction to the forum has been tremendous. Yes, we actually had around 90 adult and youth participants. It was a half-day event, and we had a great response and turnout. Tell me a little bit about what you're trying to accomplish through this program. First and foremost, we are trying to build youth leadership communication skills that build upon everything they already know within 4-H, whether it's a project talk, an illustrated talk, being able to speak in public. We want to deepen what they already know, all the valuable skills that they've learned, to be able to incorporate things like tough conversations, communicating empathy and compassion when there is disagreement, and also leading change. So this is something that they learn through exercises, one-on-one communication. How are you teaching this? Well, there are a lot of events that already build their leadership communication skills like Citizenship in Action, Kansas Youth Leadership Forum, and Citizenship Washington Focus. This is meant to be interwoven into those events so that they can deepen their leadership communication skills. And we actually start 
with a conversation boot camp, which allows them to develop just fundamental conversation skills like conflict analysis, understanding different communication and conflict styles, being able to listen for affirmation or listen for inflammation. So that is a half-day workshop that youth leaders go through. We actually had our first one this summer. And then from there, they voice interest in wanting to do 4-H community conversations. So this is a series then? It is a series, yes. And we use curricula from the Conflict Resolution Network and also from National Issues Forums. National Issues Forums has a lot of different topics to choose from, and youth actually voted on the topic, which was how to prevent mass shootings in our society. But in fact, there are a lot of youth topics that can be chosen. And this is something now that you're starting to get requests to do more trainings. Yes, and not just going in to do 4 H community conversations, but the whole shebang. So we have had requests from places like Douglas County, McPherson County, right here in Riley County, Anthony Middle School wants to do one. And so what is really interesting is the people coming and requesting this really want to create a sustainable program so that they can host community conversations throughout the year on a variety of topics. So that entails training youth and adults to be facilitators of the event within their local units, and then actually coordinating and doing an event that is around a societal issue that has not been resolved. And when we talk about community conversations, this is not just student to student or peer to peer. This is the entire community? Yes. We also use this as a 4-H recruitment event so that the community can see you know, who we are and what we value and what we do. So we do invite community members to get involved, and it's open to anyone, just like Discovery Days would be, any interested youth, adults, volunteers, agents. We even had whole families come to the October event where parents wanted to be put in an adult group to learn what their children were learning about because, like I've said before, adults have trouble being civil about some of these topics, and so I think we can learn a lot from watching youth go through this process. (laughs) It is kind of a refresher and kind of a wake-up to how we should be acting towards one another. Yes, I think sometimes in our society, if we don't have some rules for civility, it's kind of mass chaos. (laughs) And so it's been really inspiring to see youth not only learn the rules of civic and civil engagement, but also to see them actually do it and stick to it, not just in community conversations, but in other areas of their life. That's given me a lot of hope. So what's your role and 4-H's role moving forward with this program then? Well, uh, right now it would be to get the word out about all the variety of topics that can be used to facilitate a 4-H community conversation. There are topics such as childhood obesity, how can we prevent the opioid crisis in America, gun violence, all kinds of topics. So that's one. The second one is to help people help themselves to be able to use this material and train trainers to be able to facilitate these conversations. And that's where that sustainability comes in then, being able to train others and kind of keep this passing down through the generations? Absolutely. So for example, I will be doing a conversation boot camp with some youth and volunteers in Dodge City on January 18th, actually. And so the goal there for me would be to give them that material, to have them learn it, work with it, and eventually have them do a community conversation next year, because then they can make it their own and it's more meaningful to them. And I think they will be more accountable for creating a sustainable program that way. I'm kind of thinking that this is probably not a costly program because this is about communication and getting together and and talking over issues. You are exactly right. The costs are extremely minimal. Most of the curricula is free and easy to download online. You know, we need markers, flip chart paper, you've got to print out some of the material, but it's really minimal in the grand scheme of things for what you get out of it. Something that really is valuable and, and really kind of something that we're trying to do through 4-H is get this community involvement, this community conversation going. Yes, you know, civic engagement, leadership, communication, it's really hard to know where one stops and another one begins because we really need all of those skills to develop our citizenship 
and our leadership. And I wanted to share what the Kansas Leadership Center says about leadership. And that's something that we really focus on during community conversations. Leadership is an activity. It's not a position. Anyone can lead anytime, anywhere. And we have to remember that it's risky, but a great leader is willing to take those risks. So during community conversations, we really urge youth and adults as they're practicing civility, to go outside their comfort zone, speak their mind respectfully, and also be open to new ideas, and take risks and try new things. And when that happens, we see transformation. It sounds like you've got some trainings lined up for the immediate future, but if people are interested in learning more about this, how can they do that? Well, they should contact me directly at alaya at ksu.edu, and we would be happy to help them learn how to host their own community conversation in the future. That's Kansas 4-H Culture and Communication Skills Specialist, Alaya Mestrovich C. Again, to learn more about community conversations, visit kansas4h.org or contact Alaya via email, which is available on the 4-H website. And that'll do it for the Monday edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.